everyone, and welcome to the Rutgers Geology Museum's Ask a Geologist web series. Uh, today, we have Dr. David Robinson. He's a distinguished professor in the Department of Geography at Rutgers University, and he is also New Jersey's state climatologist, and he will be speaking to us about the role of snow in the climate system today. So without further ado, uh, the stage is all yours. All right, terrific. Thanks, Rhea, and, 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 and thanks at, to everyone at the Geology Museum before I forget to say so otherwise. Uh, and, and welcome to everyone, and thanks for joining uh, this afternoon to learn a little bit about uh, snow. So uh, a, a look back to winter, although in New Jersey, you only have to look back to last month uh, when we had some rare May snow. So let's get this road, uh, this show on the road here. Um, although it's gonna be very difficult in that car, you can see in the upper uh, lower left there, that's actually from West Milford, New Jersey, uh, back almost a decade ago after obviously a very uh, potent snowstorm. Um, they asked me to say a little bit about myself. I am born and raised in New Jersey escaped uh, for college in Pennsylvania for four years and was over at Columbia University uh, for graduate school in the Lamont Artie Earth Observatory. Although truth be told, I was still living in New Jersey while in grad school. Um, I am, uh, I'm a weather geek, often known as weather weenies out there. Um, I was volunteered to take weather records for a fourth grade assignment uh, in McKay's school up in Tenafly with Miss Coyle, and I'm still taking daily weather records, um, both personally and uh, some of you may know my work as state climatologists. We have over 60 weather stations around the state uh, taking recordings every five minutes of multiple weather variables. And we have a volunteer observing program called Coco Raz, where we have close to 300 citizen scientists helping us out taking weather observations on a once a day basis across the state. They said, say something personally, I'm a proud grandfather. Um, Skylar was born last Monday and she joins uh, my 17 month old grandson, Nathaniel. Nathaniel lives down in Annapolis, Maryland and Skylar is up here in central New Jersey. Um, we already mentioned my, my links here as a professor in the Department of Geography since uh, 1988. And since 1991, uh, I've been, if you're from Jersey, your state climatologist. And of course, my favorite thing, my favorite weather element is, is snow. Um, moving on, why, what's so important about snow? Um, so many different ways. Snow is such an important variable in the climate system. It is a water reservoir. Um, here in the east, not as much, although winter snowpacks in the mountains of the northeast feed reservoirs in the spring. Um, but out west in the United States, and, and for literally billions of people around the world near the Himalayas in India and China and, 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 and in the Middle East, it serves as a reservoir, uh, the winter snowpack, to melt during the summer and, and feed the rivers for irrigation purposes and, and for drinking water. Um, and, and of course, it also serves as a resource for um, moistening up the soils for the planting season come spring. Um, it can influence weather in the short term, climate in the long term, and of course, vice versa. Uh, we'll talk about that some in the next few minutes. Uh, it can be dangerous. You can see the traffic there on the turnpike during the infamous November 15th, 2018 snowstorm, which put the entire New York metropolitan area all the way down to Philly in gridlock for hours on end after a very quick hitting snowstorm at the absolutely wrong time of the day, early to mid afternoon struck the the region, but there's also, for instance, avalanche dangers in many mountainous parts of the world. Uh, very important for wildlife uh, as an area to, uh, to insulate them if they're in the ground during the winter or near the ground, um, providing moisture for them. Um, if it gets too deep or too icy, it can inhibit their 
travel, which was quite dangerous and so on and so forth. And then it's simply just fun to play in, uh, whether you're sledding, building a snowman, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, snowmobiling. It's wonderful re for recreational purposes. Um, snowfall and snow cover. There's really two, two broad sides to this issue. Uh, you can see on the left there, someone up in the lake effect region of New York fighting through a snowstorm, uh, a lake effect uh, snowstorm just this past winter. In the lower, in the right there is the aftermath of a very wet March snowstorm several years ago uh, that was taking down trees left and right as I was out on my cross country skis, it was like gunshots going off around here, very dense, wet snow. And that snow on the ground, although it still was falling at that part. And again, both are influenced by weather and climate conditions, and both influence weather and climate conditions. And yes, it is a proverbial chicken and egg, uh, as again, we will get to in a moment. But first, let's look back at last winter. Uh, how much snow fell across the lower 48 st states last winter? This is from a NOAA lab, uh, the Operational Hydrologic Remote Sensing Center lab. And you can see that in uh, the northern tier of states, upwards of multiple feet of snow fell, with some heavier areas in the lake effect rate regions of the upper peninsula of, of Michigan, off the, the Great Lakes lakes with lake effect snow and in northern Maine, a real hot spot uh, for snow last winter. And, and with that, um, you can see decreasing totals as you went further south. Zeroing on the northeast, you can better see those lake effect areas and the snows of northern Maine. And you'll notice rather meager totals in the inch to multiple inch range down in the New Jersey mid-Atlantic region. Um, and now we zero in further. See, this is the geographer in me, if you will. We've looked at the macro scale, the meso scale. We're still in a meso scale, intermediate scale here as we go from the Northeast into New Jersey. And you can see most of South Jersey had an inch or two of snow at best this past winter season, while up in the hills to the North, upwards of a foot to two feet, maybe even a little more than two feet up at this highest elevations fell. This area of South Jersey, we have records for the state divisionally speaking and the state as a whole going back to 1895. It was the least snowy winter in Southern New Jersey of all those 126 winters. Statewide, it was the third least snowy winter behind the winters of 1972-73 and 1918-19. So a long way between winters that have had such little snow, just three to four inches of snow on average across the state this past winter. This is one of, this was the biggest storm of the season up in the highlands. And you can see how wet that snow was and it led to all sorts of tree damage akin to the damage shown in that earlier photo from that March storm in central New Jersey several years ago. A winter wonderland, but with it fraught with hazards and danger and prolonged power outages. Why did we have so little snow this past winter? So we're still talking about snowfall here, folks. Well, it has to do with the storm tracks. This through mid to late winter was generally where the storm tracks went across the country. And you notice most of them zipped right across the country and headed off to our north and west. And when that happens, the mid-Atlantic is left in the warm sector of these storms. The winds turn counterclockwise around these storms as they travel east. And that pulls up warm air into the mid-Atlantic. And with the storms off to our west, they also don't tap the Atlantic's moisture. So you don't have a lot of moisture and it falls in liquid form, rarely as white snow. There was one storm that snuck across the south that gave four, four six inches of snow. And this is really where I do most of my research. Um, I love a good snowstorm. 
But here's a case where I really get down into the nitty gritty of my studies. And it comes around to, did it snow because it's cold or is it cold because it snowed? And of course you might guess already, the answer is yes. And let me explain. Here's a situation where we had one of our largest, the largest for the Highlands, early season snowstorm on record in New Jersey, back one year to the day before Sandy struck New Jersey. And here you can see up in Bergenfield and Bergen County, multiple inches of snow and upwards of a foot of snow up in the Highlands. And uh, this is up by the Kinnatinny Ridge near High Point. And that left northern New Jersey covered with snow the next day when the skies cleared, but southern New Jersey was shut out of the snow. This is a satellite image showing snow-covered northeast and snow-free mid-Atlantic here. So what that is a case of, it was cold enough early in the season for it to snow. There was no snow on the ground beforehand. There was no snow nearby beforehand. So it's not the snow that cooled thing all, things off to allow um, the next storm to come in and deposit more snow and make it cold. It was cold, the moisture came in, and thus it snowed. However, this case, snow was already on the ground. And with that, it's very highly reflective. So Solar radiation comes in on a clear day like this. This is another similar satellite image with snow to the north and snow free to the south. Um, and with that, the snow reflects solar radiation up back up into the atmosphere and doesn't into space, doesn't heat the lower atmosphere. It warms up the, the soils and, and such to the south, and that can warm the atmosphere where we live. And also it takes energy to melt the snow and that energy goes into melting the snow and not warming the atmosphere. So you have multiple reasons why an established snowpack can keep temperatures down. And here you can see it. Here in the Northeast, you see temperatures ranging at that early February period on one particular afternoon from single digits to 70 degrees through the region. But look at New Jersey, notice where the snow and snow free zone is. Where it's snow covered, temperatures are in the low to mid thirties. Where it is snow free in the south, southern part of the state, temperatures are in the upper forties and into the fifties. And that's not because of the, uh, that, excuse me, that is because the snow here has re refrigerated the lower atmosphere and kept it much colder than in the south where there was no snow to reflect the solar energy coming in and there was no snow for that solar energy to work its magic on melting that snow so that energy went to warming the earth and subsequently the atmosphere where we live just above it so two examples of the chicken and the egg with snow and temperature here's another case Here's some snow cover across the plains in early April. There should not be snow here at this time. So one can imagine in the plains here, very reflective over the grassy plains. And a lot of that April energy is being reflected back out to space, that solar energy. And, and here the weather service recognized that. And they said that temperatures will stay where there's new deep snow cover, temperatures are gonna stay colder while the snow melts. And they say, finally, the quick snow melt will have an influence on the water levels in the creeks, but also will have an influence on it becoming warmer if the snow disappears quicker. So there you have both your hydrology on the water side and your temperature. As long as that snow stays around, it's gonna stay cooler. Once that snow gets out of there, up goes the thermometer. So, Another thing I, I do is monitor the snow cover, not just study its relationship with other climate variables. I monitor that snow. And we do that in our Rutgers Global Snow Lab. Again, we do research on snow climate interactions, but we also spend a lot of our time monitoring snow cover. And you can see here maps of the current particular day snow cover here in April 18th of this year, 
and this is where snow sat on the ground in March of this this year. Um, again, as I said, snow is white. It's known as its albedo or reflectivity. And again, you see here with that buried car up in West Milford, but you see another satellite image. And this time, all of New Jersey is snow covered. But why is it so dark here? If you know your vegetation distribution in the state, you'll know this is the Pinelands. And the snow is mostly underneath the coniferous trees. So you're, it may be sitting on some of the branches, but generally that's why it's darker here, as well as up in the Adirondack Mountains, for instance. So here, and you here you see the Great Valley, Route 81 going down across Susquehanna River, past Carlisle and down into West Virginia and Virginia. And even the Delmarva Peninsula is snow covered here as well. So that just shows you how much brighter that surface is than what we saw earlier when we saw South Jersey snow free. Um, we observed the snow on the ground, obviously, we all do that. Here's a memorable blizzard um, that hit um, mostly the eastern half of New Jersey. This is in Highland Park. This is down at Seaside Park. Snow drifts on sand dunes, if you will. And this is my favorite cross-country ski course, a golf course over in Somerset which is much better used for cross-country skiing than golfing, in my opinion. But I think I'm a vast minority based on how many golfers I see out there versus how many cross-country skiers I see out there in the winter. These little ripples in the snow from the drifting of fresh snow, here's your trivia picture, the word of the day, are known as sastrugi, these little fine snow drifts. That's a leaf right there, for instance, for scale. Oops, sorry. Then snow can get deep in some spots. This is when I was up in the Tuck Hill Plateau investigating a very heavy snowfall one time. And the, those are not piles of snow. That's the natural level of snow on the ground, about four feet of snow on the ground, four to five feet when I was up there that one time. Um, snow from the air. This is, uh, I always get a window seat when I'm flying across the country or elsewhere. Um, and here you can see a case right where we're traversing the snow line. It's snow free over here. It's snow covered over here. But you see some fields are left fallow um, and others plowed under. So you get this checkerboard pattern of bright snow covered ground versus some areas where there's more vegetation there and the snow is underneath that vegetation. And of course, here it's entirely snow free. Um, this is a case where long ago research I did in, in southeastern New York from a low-flying aircraft with a fisheye lens. Here you see a field shortly after a major snowstorm, and notice the tree right here in the middle of that field. Here's that field about a week later, and you can see it's melted out around that tree, and the snow is not nearly as bright. It's gotten dirtier, it's thinner, it's wetter. And then even a week later, a lot of that snow is melted out. So the reflectivity, the albedo has decreased as the snow melts. We see this from space. This is what the Midwest looks like after a fresh snowfall in Nebraska and Iowa, very highly reflective. Here, we can see it in North and South Dakota, just four years difference, both early April. But here, it's not a fresh snow. It's the snow that fell days earlier and has melted quite a bit, akin to the lower right image here, as opposed to the top left image here is, is fresh. This is also a really neat shot. This is cloud free snow cover in New Jersey this past December. What you're seeing here is the effect of the previous day snow squalls that came through the state. You can see a snow squall came right across just north of Trenton and over here towards um, South Asbury Park over towards Point Pleasant, I guess, right here. And a little bit of a snow band here, heavier snow burst came through here in New Jersey. So sometimes you get these wonderfully interesting patterns um, when the snow is not evenly distributed. Um, we map this snow cover. I already pointed that out in an earlier slide. These gold areas are snow covered 14th of March. And then we also have uh, climatology and we subtract what we see that day from the climatology for that day. And we find these areas in blue 
should not have snow cover on March 14th, but did this year. And the areas in red should be snow covered on March 14th this year, and they weren't. And this was a prominent signal in Eurasia all winter long. And if you read the um, Capital Weather Gang in the Washington Post yesterday, they had an article about how very, very warm Eurasia has been this year. And it's been reflected in exceedingly uh, ex uh, deficient snow cover. Um, and that early melt of snow cover helped things warm up more. So there was a chicken and egg. It was warm, cold enough in the winter to sustain the snow, even though the temperatures were well above normal, they were still below freezing. But once you got to the spring, the snow melted quickly. And with that, the ground warmed up and it made the warmth even warmer, which helped to melt even more snow. So kind of that uh, feedback process to um, increase the warmth and increase the snow melt. Um, this is what the average for February looked like the preceding month, excuse me. And you can see the areas in brown should have had a lot more snow cover in February than they did this year, even across the middle tier of the country. The northern tier did okay, as did portions of the Tibetan Plateau and eastern Eurasia. Um, so sometimes there would be huge differences from one year to the next. This is January 11th, 2011 versus January 11th, 2012. An abundance of snow cover across the lower 48 here and a real deficient amount in January 11th, 2012. Um, with that, we've looked over the last 50 years at these satellite images to see if there were trends in snow cover extent across northern hemisphere lands. And this shows you departures from normal in um, spring. And you can see spring snow cover from the 70s to the 80s to the 2000s of this decade has been decreasing. Snow is melting earlier in the spring, leading the ground bare, promoting more snow melt, and I think also influencing uh, ice melt in the Arctic Ocean. Now, the winter, not so much of a signal, maybe a little bit of an upturn in recent decade or two. But what's very interesting, and this is new for study, is fall snow cover. It was bouncing around, but this past decade, we've had an abundance of fall snow cover. And you could say, hold on, we know the planet's warming. Why is there more snow in the fall? And I was just on a dissertation committee with a student up in Canada. And, and the, his hypothesis, and they were using our snow data, uh, and I'm quite confident with this result, is this is a case where areas in the past where it's been cold enough in October and November for snow to be sitting on the ground in Siberia, for instance, didn't have the moisture. But there's been changing circulation patterns and a little bit more moisture in a warmer atmosphere and it's bringing snow into those areas and depositing it earlier. So those areas are just sitting waiting for the snow and the snow is just coming earlier now. So you can have more fall snow despite the world warming. So this is just you know kind of cutting edge work right now that's just been begun to be looked into. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how this evolves as the years fly by. And there we have the spring snow extent and my mention of the Arctic sea ice in the subsequent summer season, both declining at very similar rates. Um, so getting to the finish line here, issues warranting consideration. This is work that if you're young or old and, and listening and watching this, uh, we can get into. We need to look at things on local, regional and hemispheric, for that matter, global scales the timing of the snow season, the length of the snow season. We haven't talked much about how much snow is on the ground, which is so important for water purposes. Um, average and extremes in snow water equivalent, how much water is in the snowpack, and associated impacts on our physical environment, getting back to flora and fauna, but also societal issues um, with um, winter recreation, with snow removal, with the transportation issues involving winter snows, and the hydrologic side, enough water to, to 
to grow our crops and, and, and provide drinking water for our, um, the citizens of this planet. Um, so anyway, these are some of the things we're going to be looking for with considered continued monitoring in place from satellites, merging together different data sets, looking at detection of what we call attribution or cause investigations. Um, we've done a study that suggests that there is a link between the global warming and the spring snow cover loss, for instance. Um, and we, we're working with climate modelers, both for input into their models and to verify what their models show. And then it's very important to cooperate with social scientists out there who often help to spread the message and provide the information to make for an informed public and, and, and to make informed decisions on the use of water, for instance, related to snowpacks and so on. Um, this one, if anyone looks at the post of the slides, you can look at this. I, that's why I put this in. I don't intend to spend time on it, but it just, again, more justification for the importance of looking at snow. And then finally, as you see, I can see text messages and emails coming in. Um, if you're interested in measuring snow or precipitation for that matter, here's that volunteer group, the Kokoraz group, kokoraz.org. It's a national group. We have 300 active in New Jersey. Um, there's all kinds of online training. Uh, it's inexpensive gauge to purchase to do this and then a ruler and a lot of you know instruction on how you measure rain. And, and you think it's easy to measure snow, it's not. And, how we might measure um, snow. And with that, as I say, may all your winters be white. There again is my favorite skiing course. And with that, it's question time. I'll be happy to answer any and all of your questions. I'm gonna get out of presentation mode and I'm going to look for those questions if I can find them, but I've got to stop sharing my screen. And click on this. And here's some, come some questions. Huh. Oh, I have to go to Rhea's mom first. Um, whoops, let me, I don't know if people are seeing me right now. I'm seeing the questions. Hopefully, there you folks are seeing you. You're good. All right. Okay. So let's go to Rhea's mom question. How does hail form in places where it usually does not? I was in Dallas, Texas once, and all flights got canceled. We're not prepared for it. Well, the fact is, hail is not associated with winter events for the most part. It's associated with summer events, with thunderstorms. Now, we do have thunder snow on occasion. But hail is associated with convective storms. So it's much more common in the spring and summer than in the winter. And it's simply ice pellets that are continually recirculated high in the atmosphere where it's cold enough, even in the summer, for ice to form. And it's like an onion with layers of ice growing around uh, a nucleus. And once the updrafts can't hold it any longer or it gets too big, the hail will fall to the ground, sometimes melting on its way down, sometimes making its way down to the ground. So Dallas has had some really, really nasty hailstorms. Um, Denver, some, I mean, we're talking billion dollar hailstorms. And just over the weekend, uh, Calgary, Canada, in Alberta, Canada, had a hailstorm that took the siding off homes. Um, it was so powerful. It just just hammered away at siding on homes, breaking windshields and cars and so on and so forth. So hail, a winter phenomenon, snow, uh, a summer phenomenon, excuse me, snow, a winter phenomenon. Um, since we didn't really get snow here in New Jersey this past winter, is this going to be more common trend in the future? Yes, um, theoretically. Yes, as the models suggest out there, the climate models. Have we seen this downturn in snowfall yet in New Jersey? Interestingly enough, no. We have warmed in New Jersey. Um, we've, we've seen a several degree winter warming um, in the last several decades, 
But the fact is, it hasn't warmed enough that we still don't get snowstorms. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the two less snowy winters from the past were 1918-19 and 1972-73, a ways back. And we've had our share of snowy winters in the last 10 to 20 years. So we can still, what I like to say, pop a big snowstorm where you get enough cold air in and from the north or bring it down from aloft and you'll get a snowstorm. So we're going to continue to see snow, but with time, we should see fewer snows as a storm system comes through that instead of sitting at that magic mark of 30 or 32 degrees, starts coming in when it's 34 or 36 degrees and you have a cold rainstorm instead of a snowstorm. We've begun to see evidence of that south of here in, in the southern states, uh, but not yet this far north. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. No two snowflakes are the same shape. Actually, there was a study out of the National Center for Atmospheric Research years back now that found two snowflakes that looked exactly identical to one another. But the fact is, there are so many different processes to form a snowflake. Um, it depends on temperature of the atmosphere, the moisture conditions of the atmosphere. If there's a nucleus, the nucleus that seeds the growth of this crystal, uh, and not just in one place, but as that flake moves through the atmosphere and grows and changes shape. So it stands to reason you're going to have you know, a billion flakes. You're going to have millions of different shapes out there. But there, there, there are alike snowflakes out there. Um, what is a snow squall? And I want to go to that because I did mention a squall. Uh, it's essentially, think in the summer, you get a heavy rain shower come through and it's a partly sunny day and all of a sudden, bam, the, the rain shower hits, whether it's thunder or just a heavy shower. And then the sun's out 15 minutes later. That's the idea of a snow squall, um, except it's in the winter where you bring in just enough cold air um, and it snows briefly and then bam, it's out. We saw that on May 9th. If you're in northern or central New Jersey, we had snow squalls and up in the north part of the state, uh, it even deposited some measurable snow. Some of that snow came from the departing weather system the night before, but some came the afternoon of the ninth. Even though the temperature was like 40 degrees, it was so cold aloft and such a dynamic atmosphere that the snow came down fast enough that it didn't melt before hitting the ground, even though it was like 40 degrees in the atmosphere. So that was, um, that's, that's a snow squall. Um, how is snow measured? Um, it's not easy. Uh, as I said during the presentation, there's a whole booklet from the National Weather Service, if you want, would want to go Google it, on snow measurement guidelines. Uh, the last edition was about 2013. I was one of two non-federal people who wrote it. Um, we updated the manual from the late 90s where we had, uh, and we changed around a few things. And if you want to see, it's, it's difficult because as snow falls, it settles. So if you measure it every hour and you add up your hourly measurements, you're going to get more snow than if you wait till every six hours to measure it, where it might settle some, or what the guidelines say for most citizen observers, you wait as best you can judge till the deepest part of the snow during a storm, which may be the end of it, but it may not, or it may be when it goes from snow to rain and you measure the depth then. Now I know that could be at two in the morning and you're not necessarily gonna be up, although weather weenies will be up, um, but most people won't be. Um, so sometimes you have to use a little art along with the science, uh, but you don't wait until the next morning to go measure the snow when it stopped 12 hours ago because it will have settled. But then again, you don't measure it every hour because you're, you're going to end up with 12 inches when the, there was never more than six or seven inches on the ground. So that's what we call weather exaggeritis. Um, and, and so you have to find kind of a happy medium. So that's the measuring timeline to measuring snow, but then where do you measure it? Um, if you measure it in a wide open field and the winds are howling, 
that's not going to be accurate. So you try to go to an area where the winds are calmer, but you don't want to go to an area where all the snow's blowing in and drifting into it. So sometimes in a windy storm, you have to take a, what we call a transect and you take multiple measurements. But wait, you have to watch there too, because if you stick your ruler into the ground you, and it's a grassy field, you're also sticking it into the grass and there's a lot of air that may remain in that grass. So you're going to get an inflated total. So if the snow is falling quietly enough, you have a board, a white board. So it doesn't have a lot of heat from say the previous day's sun. And it's called a snowboard. And you go out and you measure the snowfall on your snowboard. I told you it wasn't easy. Um, so, but a lot of it is judgment. Uh, you really have to, it, it, it's one of the more difficult weather observations to take. And, and it's best taken manually by an individual. There are sensors, and we have several at our so, several of our automated weather stations where a sonar, a sound pulse, is sent from about four or five feet above the surface down to the ground. And you calibrate it when the ground's snow free. And when the ground starts getting snow covered, it's a quicker return and it estimates the depth of snow on the ground. But it's only for that little, if you will, footprint of a couple feet by a couple feet. And you don't know if that's fully representative of the area around you, but it's in some respects better than nothing. So really tricky subject. Many a paper been written on measuring snow. Um, it, is, it is a challenging exercise, let alone forget the conditions you are in when you're measuring that snow, which could be in a blizzard, uh, freezing temperatures, or, or, or even rain falling after the snow has just stopped. Um, let's see here. Ah, a little bit of topography. Does the topography of the coastal plain have anything to do with snow to the north and not to the south? Why does it seem that the cutoff is off in the coastal plain? Yeah, that's, that's the question throughout the mid-Atlantic, throughout the northeast. Um, simply put, at your higher elevations, you have less chance for those snowflakes to melt before they reach the surface. When you get down to lower elevations, you're going to be warmer. And with that, providing an opportunity for that snow to melt, to turn to rain, or to have a harder, more difficult time accumulating when it hits the ground. And that's oftentimes when you come out of the highlands of Northwest Jersey down into the Piedmont, other times is when you go from the Piedmont across the fall line and go into the coastal plain. Now, that's not always the case. It certainly was this past winter, but there are other times, such as that storm I showed you mentioned on December 26, 2010, where it was plenty cold statewide. You had to get the moisture there, and the storm was far enough offshore that it sent its snow shield inland, but only about a half a foot of snow fell in the Delaware Basin to the west, and two to two and a half feet of snow fell along the Garden State Parkway up into Bergen County because it was closer to the storm. So there was a case where topography had nothing to do with it. The moisture, the snow availability had everything to do with it. And other times the storm, like the one we saw in North Carolina and Virginia earlier this year, went south of us and deposited snow, and maybe it would have made it up to South Jersey, but the snow shield never made it up to the north. But over the long term, the hills of North Jersey get four, four and a half feet of snow a winter, where down in Cape May, you get about a foot to a foot and a half of snow in the winter down the southern plains. But I'll give you another mind twister here. The largest snowstorm on record in New Jersey was in February of 1899. And 34 inches was the largest total for that storm. And it was in Cape May. So Cape May holds the record for the largest snowstorm on record in New Jersey, yet it's the least snowy place climatologically in New Jersey. So you see, any place in New Jersey is susceptible to getting snow, but every place in New Jersey also can be cut off from that snow 
if the moisture doesn't make it to you. Um, let's see. If snow is happening earlier, then could that contribute to a possible drought in some regions that depend on snowpack? Oh, it's happening. I think leaving earlier may be the question here. Oh, yeah. We really have to worry about the low snowpacks. And we've seen it in recent decade in the Western United States. We've had a couple of really snowy years, but we've had fewer of them than on the low side. And with that, the reservoirs don't fill, the rivers don't flow uh, as readily as in a snowy winter. And with that, um, it can lead to, uh, it can be an example of drought and lead to water shortages. Um, that, that's certainly a problem in mountainous areas. Around here, the fact that we didn't have much snow this winter isn't that big a deal. It's more a matter of the fact we had a little bit below average precipitation because interestingly enough, even in our snowiest of winters here in New Jersey, about two thirds of our winter precipitation from say Thanksgiving to Easter, that's possible snow period, about two thirds falls as rain, even in a snowy winter. So we don't rely in New Jersey too much on winter snows for our water supplies. It helps in our highlands because it may melt more slowly and, and, and then flow nicely into the reservoirs. The Delaware River is fed by snows up in the Catskills and parts of the Eastern Poconos, and they retain snow during the winter. So the Delaware flow is influenced, but it's, it's not a real big factor here in New Jersey. Our biggest concern is in a winter where we have a lot of snow on the ground and we have three or four inches of liquid locked up in that snowpack. And we worry about a warm a rainstorm coming through, giving us two inches of rain and melting three inches of liquid water in the snow. And there we have floods. Um, we've seen them in the past, big one back after the big snowstorm in January of 1996, for instance. Um, definition of a blizzard. It is, um, winds have to be gusting, I think about over 35 miles an hour. Um, visibility has to be reduced to, what is it, a quarter of a mile? You got me here, a quarter of a mile or less for three consecutive hours. There used to be a temperature uh, um, qualifier to this, but that was eliminated quite a, several decades ago. I'm aging myself here. So it's, and, and it could be in, the visibility could be reduced in falling or blowing snow. So it doesn't even have to be snowing to have a blizzard. If the visibility near the surface of the earth is reduced to very low levels for at least three consecutive hours, you would call it a blizzard. Um, so they're pretty rare here in New Jersey, and they're more likely to occur in areas that are quite wide open, fields, along beaches, maybe at airports, unfortunately. Um, the best place to measure snow, I think I mentioned earlier, um, a sheltered location, but not under trees. I don't mean that kind of shelter. The, the trees will intercept some of the snow. So an area where you know there's not a lot of drifting, and there's not a lot of trees, you're not near a building that could heat and melt some of the snow. So better there than way out in the middle of a field where things could blow around. Um, a deck near your house, not so great um, because snow may blow off the roof down onto the deck or opposite wise, the warmth of the house could reduce the snow. Not best on a picnic table because it's elevated a little and the wind can blow the snow off of it. Uh, I told you it wasn't easy, but we have wonderful citizen science observers in the Kokoraz program. And with so many around the state, we can use everyone's measurements to kind of quality control each other's measurements. And with that, we'll often write our observers and say, did you measure this when the snow stopped or 12 hours later? Or, you know, did you measure a drift of snow and not snow equally distributed on the ground? And, and that really helps us, as I said, quality control um, our observations. And that's, again, credit to the number of people. We'll get 200 observations from our Kokoraz observers, from National Weather Service spotters. Now, some do both. 
and from some other station reports after a snowstorm. And it's just wonderful because it provides us information we can use for potential flood forecasting. Uh, it provides information on to do a, a post-mortem, if you will, of the storm. Why was traffic so impacted? Well, a lot of snow fell in a short period of time. And frankly, our data are used heavily by the snow plowing community because many snow plowers plow based on the depth of snow. They charge more for four to six inches than one to four inches and six to 10 inches and so on. And, and, and that impacts how much the people getting plowed pay and how much the plowers earn. And they turn to us as the impartial arbiter, if you will, the impartial judge of, of what's going on. Cause I think you could probably tell from all my babbling, I wanna get it as correct as possible. So we say that our data are representative of the snow that fell in that part of the state with the storm. And I'll tell you, when we have a snowy winter and we get 15 snows with measurable snow somewhere in the state, and we put all these records together, our website, um, and you can find it off of njclimate.org, that will get hit, just that snow page will get hit 40,000 times in a winter season. Some for folks like me, who just want to see how much snow fell, others for very practical and monetary purposes. Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Ha, is the snow line always more or less the same in New Jersey? Um, no, I think I, I pointed that out with some of my examples, but if you look climatologically over a long enough period of time, yeah, it, you often hear, and you know, the great part about Jersey, ah, uh, so many great parts about New Jersey, but we're, we're densely populated and we have a lot of roadways. So it's often great. You say, well, north of Route 80 or between Route 80 and Route 78, or south of 195 or the Atlantic City Expressway or inland of the Parkway or northwest of the Turnpike, um, you can often define where your snow line is. Uh, and the beauty is we have so many roads like that that allows us to vary our description of where the most or least amount of snow fell. Um, I got one question. Let me go up and see what Mary from Scotch Plains how to say had to say. Um, will I like this one? Just grab one here. Will the snowflakes capture pollutants and take them out of the air? Yeah, um, just like raindrops do. Um, your cleanest air is generally during an event or immediately after an event, whether it's snow or rain. Um, so yeah, they're pretty effective ways of scrubbing the air uh, of pollutants. Um, and, and if there's enough snow, it's gonna take a while for the vehicles and planes to get going again. So you might get a couple of uh, clear days and uh, we don't have to talk about what we've seen um, in the last several months and the impacts it has had on our atmospheric particulate matter and gaseous content as well. Um, is there anything like a hailstone encased by snowflakes or a snowflake encased by a hailstone? I suppose the latter, um, it would start as a snowflake, a crystal, and then um, a hail, you get what's called rhyming around it, where you'd go right from vapor to a solid and you would um, form a hailstone. But a hail, so a, a hailstone encased by snowflakes, no, you would not see that. That's too large a nucleus for a snowflake. So you could have a snowflake that morphs into a hailstone, but you're not gonna have a hailstone that is kind of morphs in, into a snowflake. Um, will climate change cause differences in humidity that affect snowflake structures? Oh yeah. Uh, no question, snowflakes are so much determined by the temperature and, and of course the moisture content, but the temperature where they form in the atmosphere and where they continue to grow in the atmosphere. So you'll have a, 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 a warm, milder, still sub-freezing obviously, um, snowflake um, with more moisture will f it available will have a very different shape 
and, and different dimensions and water content than a drier snowflake formed with a dr somewhat drier atmosphere and colder atmosphere. It's, it's not my bailiwick, it's not my area of study, but yeah, you, a snow, and a snowflake is not, a snowflake is not a snowflake. And let me add that when snow, when it, things get pretty wet and the snowflakes get a little tacky, what you see falling when you see a big snowflake fall, it's probably almost surely multiple snowflakes that have just kind of conglomerated together. So it's a loosely packed snowball, if you will, falling down to the ground. So you have to separate the individual snowflakes from the agglomeration of snowflakes that may, can make a, a, a super big looking flakes, you know, half dollar size flakes, if you will. Um, with climate warming, ah, here's a snow cover question. With climate warming, will there be more changes in the reflectivity of snow due to organisms growing in the ice or snow fields like red snow and ice worms? And, and the answer is, yeah. Um, not only that, but with nearby, um, with nearby drier areas, this is something they've seen in Colorado. I've been out there and seen it in Colorado. Snow blowing off the southwestern um, areas of the country deposit um, dust on the snow. Now that's not living matter, but also within snowpack, you there is a vibrant micro environment in there, and, and with further growth of those, they would darken the snow, just like the dust darkens the snow. There's concern um, with oil burning in the Middle East off of oil platforms depositing soot on snow in the Himalayas and promoting more snow melt, reducing the size of glacial growth. Um, there's been a lot of studies that have looked, uh, even up uh, on the Greenland ice sheet, getting more dust up there. I was involved in a study long ago now where it's sand, dust was mineralogically was traced back to the Gobi Desert of, of East Asia was found in snows of Baffin Island in Northern Canada. Um, and it just blows there. And that will change the reflectivity of the snow and potentially enhance um, melting. Let's see, we got time for another question or two. I'll go off topic for a second. Someone asked, is um, the National Weather Service is got a poll out now. Uh, you can probably find it somewhere where they're talking about their nomenclature. And this is a wonderful way to start ending it, where the merger of social science and, and physical science, because they issue alerts and watches and warnings. Um, they have like 110 different ones for all different weather phenomena. And the public is confused. There's just too much information. And people don't particularly understand the difference between an alert and a watch maybe an alert and a warning. A watch means something might happen in the near future very quickly. A warning means it's there, it's happening, or it's about to begin. A tornado warning, something has been spotted or there's rotation seen in a um, radar, or six inches or more snow is gonna fall. Now, if they all of a sudden say, no, not that much snow is gonna fall, they'll say, well, there's an alert for a couple of inches of snow. Well, the public's very confused. So now they're talking about revamping their nomenclature and going to more plain language statements, still perhaps continuing with warnings, but may certainly getting rid of alerts. This is the suggestions out there and maybe better defining watches to go into a why, a when, a where, that kind of nomenclature. I took the, um, the questionnaire uh, uh, yesterday, the day before, and it's very interesting. And they're really looking for the public's input on this. So if you look for weather questionnaire, National Weather Service questionnaire on alerts, watches, and warnings, uh, very important. And and it and the social scientists are going to be looking at this and testing the public to see which ones, you know, for myself, um, you know, Matt Drews and, and others here at Rutgers. Uh, we understand these things, but you have to sit back and go, hold on. This is kind of our full-time interests, not just jobs, interests full-time. 
And for most people, it's not. So we've got to get it right. So for the vast, vast majority of people to understand these things and in the long run, save lives. So maybe that's the best way to end things here on a, a non snowyish question because it transcends smoke, the dust, to severe storms, to hurricanes, to yes, snowstorms, blizzards, and snow squalls. So thanks very much for listening in today. It's been a pleasure. Um, my email is david.robinson at rutgers.edu if you have any further questions. And again, it's been a pleasure to join you this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. And for everyone who's uh, listening, uh, don't forget to tune in on Thursday, June 18th at 11 a.m. We will have Ashlyn Spector. She's a graduate student at Rutgers in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And she will be speaking to us about barrier islands. And once again, that's on Thursday, June 18th at 11 a.m. And thank you again, Dr. Robinson. And I hope you have uh, an enjoyable rest of your day. You too as well, Rhea, and thanks to everyone again. Be well.